the Business Simplicity Podcast, where leaders share their most successful strategies and the failures that inspired them, so business owners and managers can avoid the suffering and reap the benefits. With your host, your host Chris Parker. And welcome back to the Business Simplicity Podcast. This is Chris Parker, and I am having a conversation with David King Lassman. And he is a founder and, and, and was the CEO of Gig XR in the mixed reality space. And we're going to get into all of that. Um, really, really curious. We were introduced from my um, my sister. Um, right. And yeah, David purchased an animal from her. And maybe we'll get into that part of the story as well. But before we start, I do want to do a quick plug. If you're watching this on, on, on video, I've got my mustache coming in. Um, and that's about Movember and Movember is what well, happens every year. And it's, you know, celebrating the need for investment and in, in, in improvements in men's health, uh, physical health, mental health. Um, what, what, one thing that, that we've you know, learned from Movember is, you know, suicide is, is one of the leading deaths of men between 25 and 45, which is a, a shocking, you know, thing to understand. So if, if, uh, anyone's interested in supporting that, um, I'll put a link in, in there so you can donate to Movember. Or if you're not willing to or interested in, 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 in donating, my suggestion is just call someone who you're, you care about and ask them how they're doing. And maybe that can be you know, what, people, so what people need just to brighten their day. So, um, so with that, um, David, can you kick us off with, you know, and I'm so curious about this question. Like, what is it that you, that you do, David? So you correctly introduced me as a founder and an ex-chief executive officer. Um, so let's start with the former. So as a founder, as I'm sure your audience knows, you know, a founder establishes a company. Um, I've been a serial entrepreneur my whole life. I started my first business ooh, longer than I care to admit. Oh, no, it was in the 80s. Sorry, early 80s. Um, actually started that to finance my way through music school, assuming that I'd be a musician. And uh, by the time I graduated music school, my business was doing quite well. So I thought, oh, that's, that's, that's nice. You know, I've got a little bit of money and renting an apartment in central London. And that's, that, that was cool. Um, and I thought, I'll, I'll go back to music eventually. And I'll just do this next thing and this next thing. And I, I, I guess um, I got a bit of a bug. I got a bit of a bug for starting things, starting businesses. And uh, that's the part of establishing a business that I love the most. Uh, those early days, you know, where you're trying to pluck something out of the ether and you build a vision and a strategy for executing against that vision. You know, roll up your sleeves and you work really, really hard for years and you ask yourself every day, is this worth it? Because you're not making any money and you're not sure if the business is going to work or not, but you believe it will. And so it was with this latest venture, GigXR, which uh, uh, I founded in, in, in well, it, formally in 2019 when the company was incorporated, but I've been working on the idea for some time before that. And, uh, you know, it was me. And I brought in a couple of guys and started building out a little bit of a team. And then we raised a little bit of money and then we raised a, bit, a little bit more money and, this notion of an idea started to gestate and develop. And, and then we started to get customers and we started to say, oh, wait a minute, this is actually, this actually might work. And, uh, and then we had a business and we were employing a bunch of people and we were selling all over the world. And as a founder and as a chief executive officer, uh, I had lots and lots of responsibility and, managing the business on a day-to-day -day basis and dealing with your board and dealing with HR issues and trying to keep everything together. And uh, I will hold my hand up and say that that's not really the best use of my time, all of that sort of day-to-day -day stuff. And the idea of bringing somebody in to kind of steer the ship a little bit and and take hold of the reins and and it was very appealing. And, and Thankfully, now we have an absolutely phenomenal CEO who's doing all the right things. You know, he's fantastic with the team and he's fantastic at helping to drive the strategy and he's great at talking to investors. And, and that leaves me free, well, to do things like this, Chris, 
quite spend some time chatting with you and to uh, continue to nurture the relationships that we have with some of our very important partners and identify new opportunities in the market, whether it's working with great medical institutions to help drive product or uh, great technology companies that could be complementary to what we're doing, you know, getting up on stages and speaking about what GigXR is doing and evangelizing the vision. I'm, I'm curious if, if maybe to ask that question a little bit different is, is how would you define for you, what is the absolute best use of your time? Like of all those things that you could be doing, what, what, what is, what is that superpower of that magic that, that is the absolute best investment of your time through the, the different companies you founded yeah i mean that's a good question and it's one that i would probably answer differently depending on the business um so one of the challenges that we have uh in this business is we're working with a medium called mixed reality um and mixed reality is a a very nascent medium uh we're very familiar with virtual reality where users are fully immersed in a digital world the physical world is occluded mixed reality uses devices like Microsoft's HoloLens or Magic Leap, uh, they have a clear visor so I can see the physical world. I could see you if you were in the, I was in the room with you. But in the space between us, we can broadcast holographic content. Uh, and we augment the physical world with digital content in a way that affords tremendous new opportunities. So one of the things we have to do as a business operating within this new paradigm is we need to educate. So I think the part of my job is very much going out there and saying, let me tell you about mixed reality and let me tell you about why mixed reality is really, really powerful and really good and why you need to embrace it. And if you are a medical institution and you're training medical professionals, mixed reality has a very, very sensible solution that's going to be able to address some of the most challenging and complex uh, uh, elements of the way that you teach and the way that you learn and the way that you retrain uh, and will drive real value. Let me show you how. So I think that's a very important part of what I'm doing. Um, and just really putting the brand out there. Uh, you know, our, our ambition is strong. We want to be the de facto standard platform for the delivery of mixed reality training in healthcare right across the board on a global scale. And there's a lot of work that we need to do to entrench that position. Um, and it's not just about selling product. We've got fantastic salespeople. Uh, we've got a global sales force that are doing that really, really well. But it's about building those relationships. Um, you know, it would require a huge amount of hubris to think that, you know, we could do that all on our own. We can't. Uh, you know, we need to stand on the shoulders of other giants, whether they're Tremendous medical institutions like Cambridge University Hospitals, for instance, with whom we've collaborated on building product together or Michigan Medicine out here in North America, um, you know, working with these guys to say, hey, look, here's what we can do. Help us steer product in a way that's going to drive value. Uh, and part of my job is helping to build those relationships. In addition to the relationship, <clears throat> and, and and as founder and on on LinkedIn, they also call you the, the chief evangelist, and it sounds like it's really evangelical work. Um, so something is new, or um, I don't want to call it abstract, but like with mixed reality, what's the best way to land that? You know, because it's uh, is this something that people have to experience physically before it really the penny drops, mm. or is this something that you can, you know? I, I, I can't imagine you can send them a white paper of text and they would go have an aha moment. So mm -hmm. uh, eventually they need to you know, connect that to that, well, that training issue mm -hmm. and go, Oh, wow. Yeah. How do you get, how do you get to the, Oh, wow. Yeah. It's a great question. Um, and actually something that I think has been consistent across all of the companies that I've founded that when you, They've all been in sort of emerging tech or they've all produced a technology uh, that takes something that people do and uses technology to make it easier or more engaging or more exciting or whatever. I'm going to think about one of my companies. In fact, my, what, 
one of my favorite businesses that didn't succeed, actually, a company called Viclone, which I founded in 2011 um, uh, with, with the great Joe Sumner. And, uh, you know, Joe is a fantastic rock musician, came to me and said, hey, look, I, I played this gig at a big stadium last night. And next day, there were like 500 videos on YouTube from like Rosie. And the sound was terrible. And I was just a dot somewhere far in the distance. And but if I could take all those videos and bring them together into one contiguous video, you know, wouldn't that be cool? How can I do that? It's like, there's nothing that does that. That's really difficult to do. Let's see if we can fix that. And so we went on this wonderful journey where we built a technology that takes videos recorded on mobile devices, sends them up to the cloud, magically uh, synchronizes them on a timeline, and then algorithmically cuts a video from all the best angles with one audio source underneath it, producing this beautiful video. And I'm, I'm going to name drop here, right? So we were, we, we, when we were trying to raise money, and we had some good connections in, in, in the entertainment industry. And we met this guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who said, you know, this is the kind of thing Ashton Kutcher would be really interested in. Right. And so the next thing we know, we're in Ashton's trailer on the set of Two and a Half Men. And he kind of, he's, he's a great guy, very, very smart. And he says, so tell me what you do. And I said, I'm going to show you what we do. And we took out our mobile phones and we recorded a 30 second video. And a minute later, we returned from our server, this beautiful video from each of those angles with one good audio source underneath it. And we said, we just made this multi-angle movie in a minute. And he went, that's brilliant, right? Now, if I hadn't have had the ability to demonstrate that technology, I would have had to have gone through a PowerPoint deck, and lots of slides and lots of models and go to market strategy. He saw the magic and he immediately jumped in and, and backed it. Literally, we got term sheet the next day. Similarly, with this business, if I had to describe to you right now what we do, you know, you might get a little bit zoned out. But if you had a headset on or if you were accessing our technology through your mobile device, and we were running through how you learn a particular medical procedure or how do you identify uh, a, 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 some condition that this person is suffering from. And you see that person in your room, the room next to you and you're able to walk around that person and you see me and I say, hey, look, maybe if you pick up a stethoscope and put it on this woman's chest, tell me what you hear. You get that sort of jaw dropping moment. Mm. Being able to demonstrate a technology that people have never experienced before and they then make the association to how they can use this to do something that is that, that, that traditionally what they've done is, is, is done it with mannequins like these inanimate plastic life-size mannequins that you put on a gurney in a simulation lab right? and it all comes alive so our challenge was i don't want to get on the phone with you and tell you about what we do I want to get in the room with you and yeah. show you what we do. Well, on your podcast, Explore XR, and um, mm. maybe you could unpack that a, a, a bit as well. But one of the podcast episodes I listened to was was someone maybe from Unity who was explaining the the training need, um, and it was it was like like field triage and, and, and trying mm. to train people on how to stop the bleeding of someone who howling in pain and cursing you and, mm. and, and the, the intuitively the last thing you would want to do is actually apply pressure to that wound, mm -hmm. but through training, that's realistic training. Um, people can overcome that and, and actually do the right thing despite the, the human you know, emotional reaction, which would be to do something else. Right. Um, I think that's incredible. Is, 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 yeah. is, is, are those types of, oh my God, training moments sort of part of your everyday life is, is uh, yeah. If so I, I'm very yeah. jealous. Uh, so, so, uh, so that's, yeah, that podcast was, was with Luke Devore, uh, who does work at unity and, and had a background in the military and he's terrific. He's, he's a visionary and he's great. And, People should definitely listen to that podcast because he's really insightful. Um, 
so I think one of the things that's very difficult in the when we think about training medical professionals is that you can learn uh, the basics and you can practice, you know, how to suture on a, a piece of foam. But when you get into clinical experience and somebody's actually screaming or moving, everything changes. So how do we use technology to better prepare those students for the clinical experience? Uh, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. We're working with uh, some great folks at the University of Michigan here in North America. And, and, and one of the consultants that I was chatting with was saying a very common procedure that every, every doctor needs to learn is an NG tube, where you put a tube up the nose down into the stomach to either take fluid out or put fluid in, right? Very common procedure. And you practice it on a mannequin. What you don't learn when you're practicing on a mannequin is that as soon as this tube hits the back of the, the nose and hits nasal membrane, there's a reaction. The head jumps or uh, the patient sneezes. And then when it goes to the back of the throat, the patient moves and lurches. You cannot recreate that mm. with a piece of plastic. When you see that being done holographically, and we can do things like we can work out, you know, how far that tube, that holographic tube has gone to the nose, and that when it hits a certain point, we can animate the patient to respond in a certain way. The student goes, oh, yeah, I get that. That's going to happen. So now I'm ready for that when I'm doing it for real. Now, in the military, they've got a whole bunch of other problems that they've got to deal with. So imagine being, first of all, every member of the military has to have a certain amount of basic medical training you know you're on the front line something happens to your pal he gets a severe leg wound you've got to treat him you can't wait for a, a qualified doctor to get there and i think the example that luke was talking about the podcast is doing a tourniquet yeah you do a tourniquet and the guy is absolutely screaming because it hurts to apply a tourniquet but you've got to keep going because you've got to stop the blood no matter how they're screaming but meanwhile all around you, you know bullets might be flying and bombs mm. are going off so if you can simulate that in a hyper-realistic environment, wearing a headset, and you you know, okay, I know bullets are going off around, but I've still got to stay focused. I've still got to do this job. And I know this guy's screaming and reacting and his body's moving, but I've got to hold him down. I've got to get it done because otherwise he's going to die, right? When that moment comes, heaven forbid that you're actually on the front line and that is happening, you are going to be better prepared because you've gone through a rigorous, hyper-realistic training program that prepares you for clinical experience in a way that no other technology can and anyone in the medical profession when they see this up close and personal the penny drops and they go yes i get yeah. it and i need it so i'm i'm and i will include the in, in the show notes the, the link to that episode and, and there's a number of episodes it's it's um it's a fun podcast because you're you, it's a technology-based podcast but you you seem to really talk about the the human dimension there um mm. which, which is really fun the the question that's emerging is, is with gig XR, it's, it's, you know, mixed reality. What I'm curious on is how did you choose the, the use case or the industry segment? Um, and, and for me, it's a bit of a selfish question because um, a number of years ago, I was, I was involved in a, in a, in a, a big data, a data analytics startup uh, with some people that had worked with the NSA. We had the best of everyone and we were mm -hmm. never able to niche down to an, an industry. And we, after about a year and a half, we, we, we folded it because there was not incredible technical capability without connecting to an actual repeatable sellable product how with the with gig xr did you embark down the medical training path because i can imagine there's an, an, an endless amount of use cases that yeah would, would be equally as interesting so um yeah. why this tech to that yeah. problem so to answer that question we got to go back a little bit to the genesis of the business um so in 2015, Microsoft, uh, ahead of the launch of their HoloLens mixed reality device, approached Pearson, who's one of the world's leading educational publishers, and said, look, if we invest some, uh, some dollars into your company, will you fire up a little unit to build some applications for the HoloLens? So when the HoloLens hits the market, there's some good content that people can interact with. And Pearson put together a team of a dozen or so people out of their UK office, and they built five applications. Two of those applications were medical training applications. The other three were K through 12 products. 
And when Pearson was going through a big restructuring, uh, they were divesting of that unit and I bought it. Right. So that, that was the genesis of gig XR. And what I saw back then was the opportunity not to operate as a content company. I, I, don't, I don't, don't think there's a future. There wouldn't have been a future or it would have been an interesting future if we'd have just become a company that builds a bunch of apps. What I thought was a tremendous opportunity was let's build a platform upon which we develop a, a, a sort of broad, wide constellation of applications all managed through a single dashboard. And that was interesting. And I think that there, you know, there was a very strong case for developing something like that. It's, it's a well-trodden path. And in fact, the first business I had, which was an ed tech business, was exactly built on that same model, right? So we, we had a business that uh, produced test papers linked to examiners' reports and mark schemes and national curriculum and so on, headquartered in the UK. And we had one platform and you could have your English and your math and your geography and whatever it might be. And each year we'd update it with the most recent exam questions and you know, re relink it to the latest national curriculum. And once teachers bought it, once schools bought it, they just paid that license year on year. It's a very, very good, well-trodden model. The headsets, the mixed reality headsets are quite expensive. So the HoloLens is, today is $3,500. Mike Magic Leap's same sort of ballpark. We know prices are going to come down. We know they're going to be more technology companies coming to market. But right now, that, that wipes out the K-12 through market. Schools can't afford to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on hardware. So this was clearly either enterprise or higher ed. And healthcare is interesting because, as I said earlier, this kind of technology is able to address some of the most difficult and challenging parts of the curriculum, the things we can't always see, uh, the way people react to certain procedures being done to them and so on. We can mimic that. So healthcare seemed a good place to start. And then as we started to really look into the industry, realize it's a really, really big space, right? Now, it's very tempting for a company like ours to say, hey, look, we've got this fantastic underlying technology that lends itself to many, many different verticals. And you're quite right about that, right? We could, we could spin this out into architecture or HR or whatever it might be, just about anything. Anywhere where there's a, an element of learning or retraining, this kind of technology would work. The healthcare education market is a multi, multi, multi-billion global market that I think we can go a long way to establishing a really strong presence in. And if we did nothing else, we'd be able to build a very strong business in that one vertical alone. So our strategy is know the market we're in, know it really, really well, build very strong relationships with the best, you know, the best brands out there in the space. Attack it on a global scale, which we are doing, uh, and really stay laser focused. I, I know it's very tempting in startups to be broad and say, hey, we can do this and we can do that and we can do that. And they're the companies that tend to struggle to succeed. Uh, so are we ever going to get into other verticals? I'm not going to say no, but for the foreseeable future, we're very, very happy being in healthcare. I'm currently on a... <laughs> A board of um, a startup that that my my company I work with acquired, and and we're constantly having this discussion of of, of focus versus revenue. You know, so mm -hmm. so um, um, you know, at, at some point you have to sell to to you know feed the troops or or mm -hmm. find financing another way. And it's um, um, but having that discipline to to choose that patch and 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 nail it is great. So I'm I'm. Um, starting to wrap up slightly, but I'm really curious about the Viclone story that we started and didn't finish. And I'm curious if was was this crossing the chasm issue or 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 vertical issue? The yeah. And and let me let me share why. Um, probably ten years ago, I was in a team that was conceptualizing the exact same product for um. Uh, sports, but more mm -hmm. community sports, because we were thinking like, well, wait, 
if parents were out there videoing their football or soccer match, and if they were able to merge that together, then we, we, you know, it, 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 it collapsed in business casing and stuff, but it was, I love the idea. Yeah. So how, how did such an incredibly awesome idea that you actually created to demo like that, how did that fail? So, uh, I mean, in some ways, it, it didn't fail. You know, we had millions of users and we, had, we were producing phenomenal products, uh, phenomenal videos. Our community were. Um, you know, we were Apple's video app of the year in 2012. It was a, it was a great, great product. Uh, I think the reason it failed, a number of things. One is there was friction. You had to download an app. And then every time you videoed something, you had to video through the app rather than videoing natively. Mm -hmm. You know, what I wanted was Apple to buy it. And so every time you video something, a little pop-up would say, hey, do you know seven people around you were videoing at the same oh, yeah. time in the same place? Do you want to see what your video would look like merged with theirs? That would have been a winner. Mm. So there was a friction point. Um, and we tried to deal with that by allowing people to upload a video to an event that they'd recorded natively. But, you know, who's going to do that? Um, where it worked was in organized events. So things like birthday parties, rock concerts. Very, we were very successful in the music space. The other thing is we couldn't charge for this, right? So what was the business model? And that was a huge learning curve for me. That was, a, you know, we built it at a time, you know, Web 2.0, was, it, it was all about, you know, getting downloads and eyeballs and all of that sort of stuff. But I couldn't monetize it. I couldn't monetize it effectively. Um, you know, we made some money, but not enough. Um, and I, I, I think the other thing that we didn't have on our side, two things that a business like ours would have needed to succeed. One is luck and one is timing. And we screwed up on both of those. We just weren't lucky. Um, and interestingly, no one's done this since. So a handful of companies have tried and they've gone away. Um, I'm, I'm kind of shocked that Facebook or Meta didn't do that with uh, you know the community video, just to have a little algorithm that back says, hey, we could take all the video that was filmed at Burning Man and put it together in yeah. some, just do it. Um, I'm surprised they haven't. I'm sort of surprised Apple hasn't offered this as a as a really good value add. You know, even in you know just some of my favorite videos with the birthday parties. You know, the kids blowing out the candles and somebody was filming mom and someone was filming dad and someone was filming granddad and someone was filming the cake and the kid and Got these beautiful little videos that were absolutely gorgeous. Mm. Um, but yeah, luck, timing, friction, I think was the reason why it didn't work. And and I, uh, the other lesson that I learned from that was um, I, I, I kept it going because it was like my little baby that I'd incubated. And, and uh, somebody gave me some very salient advice, which was, you know, sometimes when a startup is not working, it's like you're pulling this huge boulder up a hill and it's really hard when you're doing that alone. And sometimes the best thing is to just cut the rope and let it go, which I couldn't do. I just didn't, it was, it was my baby. I couldn't do it. I couldn't abandon it. And when I did, it was like a, it was a huge relief because I, I, I really struggled at the end of it. Based on that, what, how would you know when to cut the rope? Like, like what, what the, what? what's the wisdom there? Yeah. So I, I, I think part of that is about being honest with yourself. Um, and knowing that, you know, if you can't establish a strong business case and don't have line of sight to the business, it's time to say, okay, let's quit or let's stop or let's hibernate. Let's regroup mm. later. Maybe that could be a way to go. Um, I just, I don't think I was honest with myself. I was convinced that there was a business here because I thought the idea was so good and because the technology we built was so good. It really worked really, really well. Um, but there wasn't a business and I should have known that probably a year before I did with hindsight. Yeah. But isn't that a wonderful yeah. thing? I'm having another conversation with um, a gentleman, uh, Herfel Kirchhoff, um, who's, who's uh, basically he's been a life coach for me. Mm -hmm. He used to be an enterprise architect that worked for me back in the day. And that's an episode I'm going to do specifically for Movember. And it's about um, <clears throat> in the workplace, the mental health, consequence of disappointment because mm. uh, okay i'm in an m a uh you know pe backed world right now and we're acquiring companies and not all of the darlings of, of every company survives you know the, the business cases need to be reviewed and and 
what I see is um, that can be rather quite traumatic. And it's, and it sounds like with, with this venture, you, you were really emotionally vested in it. And yeah, what, what is the, what is the mentally healthy way of acknowledging that cutting that cord grieving and moving on? Uh, you know, how did you do it? Was it, was it, how did you recover from that? Yeah. That, that That's like four or five, five years of your life. Yeah. Um, it was hard. And, uh, you know, I think there are some people that probably do that much better than others. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm definitely emotionally led. Um, that's probably why I'm less successful than I could have been. If I, if I'd have been cold hearted and ruthless and driven only by data and numbers and business, which I knew I should be, by the way, um, you know, may, maybe some of the outcomes would have been slightly different. Um, I like the fact that I've achieved successes in my life without compromising my moral core and my principles. And I, I was even kind of wise enough, if I may be so bold, to know that some of the decisions that I were taking were not necessarily the smartest ones, but they felt like the right ones. Um, my second business, for instance, uh, when the dot-com bubble burst and things, you know, were, were really, really tough, you know, I could have done a management buyout and got rid of all of my investors and sort of started fresh. And, and I couldn't do that because I felt that they'd stood by me and I didn't have the wherewithals to abandon them. So I came up with a deal that sort of worked all around and they did okay. And my team did okay. And we got the company away. We sold it and every, you know, everything was, was peachy. Uh, and one of my investors at the time said, you know, bad call, you know, you weren't thinking like a ruthless businessman. And I said, well, I'm not a ruthless businessman and which by the way that's one of the great benefits of bringing a guy like jared who's our ceo into the, into the business because i know that he is absolutely capable of making the decisions that are right for the business and entirely right for that for the business which uh you know it's been something it's been an achilles heel for me like i've always been terrible at firing people even when i knew they needed to go just really find that difficult very very happy that's off my slate right now so going back to the bike, uh, sorry, I, going back I, to your, I would be worried if people enjoy that. <laughs> you know, uh, I, hope, I hope there's no one out there just loves firing people, but sorry, yeah, keep yeah. going. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, now going back to the bike line thing, it was really hard. Um, and it was, but I did most of the sort of grieving while I was still carrying it uphill. And, and so when I did eventually let go, you know, I slept better, uh, it, you know, the, the relief was palpable and, uh, and, and, and then I was able to be, pragmatic okay had this incredible journey this incredible experience what can i take away from it what can i learn from it that i can bring into the next thing that mm. i do and boy the learnings on that i learned more from that than i did from all of my successes that's for sure yeah outstanding love it thank you for sharing um i'm starting to wrap up and and, and the last question i i have to ask is about sure. your puppy <laughs> so, uh, because again, we started this, that we were introduced by my sister, Angie, who's one of my favorite yeah. people on the planet. And, um, yeah, one of mine now, by the way, as well, she's yeah, great. She's all, and I'm just curious if, if she will listen to this, um, uh -oh. um, tell me about the, like why that puppy, what, what, uh, how was this experience for you? Like, like if you, if you could give Angie a, a message about this, this incredible little beast that's, you know, invaded your home. Okay, well, so so first of all, uh, for the benefit of your listeners, the puppy is a Lauchen. And again, it's just like mixed reality. You say Lauchen, nobody knows what you're talking about, right? Mm. Um, the, the, the best reference I know is Heart to Heart, that show with Robert Wagner from the 70s. The butler had a, a Lauchen in the show. Some people seem to remember that. But um, Lauchen's little dogs, they're between 15 and 20 pounds. Uh, they're purebred pedigree they're absolutely gorgeous they're normally cut in a way where they've got a long mane and a shaved butt and shaved legs and little booties they look a little bit like a lion dog hence little lion dog is is is, is their english name mm -hmm. um anyway i have uh twin daughters in the uk they've had lao chens in their family for 15 years um i had the great opportunity of being able to bring a lao chen from the uk to the us for my daughter who lives with me here 
and he passed away oh about eight months ago nine months ago mm. and i took a breath and i took some time and i thought ah oh, i want to get another dog i'm getting old i really want to have a dog when i'm like you, you know retired and maybe i want to travel and maybe i want to be free and maybe i don't want to be encumbered but uh, you know once you have a lachin in your life it's very hard um it's very hard not to have them and i was very blessed in that i reached out to a breeder in the us there aren't that many who was having a litter and unfortunately her litter was all uh you know assigned and she introduced me to angie and so i met angie and in fact i met angie in person with the two dogs that were siring her uh her her her, her little girls uh, uh puppies right so it was like love at first sight all around. I loved the dogs. I loved Angie. And what Angie was, it, it's been a really wonderful journey. She is the best breeder I've ever known by a mile. She, so being involved in this experience before her beautiful super even conceived of these babies, it, I, I, I became vested from day one. And, um, you know, Angie and I struck up a really great rapport and she texted me progress and photographs every day. And when the babies were born, um, she, I think she knew intuitively which one was ours. And, um, and he's called Louis and he's here and he is such a blessing. And I hope that my friendship with Angie will persist. I'm not, I, hope, I know it will. Uh, so we, we text pretty much daily and I send her updates and photographs and she sends me updates on, on the others. And we'll, we'll, you know, she, my door's open to her and the family. She can come here anytime to hang out with Louie. Not me. She don't care about me. Just the dog. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's a fan of yours for sure. Um, um, she did share that, that almost instantly she knew which puppy in the litter was for you. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think she, she invested, you know, that herself in that, in creating that. And mm -hmm. I saw her the day after, cause they drove down from San Francisco, dropped off the puppy, I think on the Saturday. Mm -hmm. And then I saw her on Sunday afternoon and Mm -hmm. And she was so appreciative and and worried, like, like, I hope the dog doesn't keep him awake and I hope it's working out. And the fact that you were sharing that, hey, things are great. Look at this. This is happening. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's very funny, actually. Um, so my kids have grown up. Uh, my youngest is 17. She's very grown up. But I find myself using the same kind of vernacular and 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 having the same sort of feelings I have with Louis as though he was baby. So, I, you know, I, I wake up and I say, Oh my God, he slept through the night. He's, I'm so proud of him. <laughs> you know? yeah. it, it's hilarious. And Love he's it. been, he, I mean, he's been, he's been super easy. Love it. So, um, so a little gift for Angie, I think, you know, someone we both appreciate and uh, yeah. I definitely appreciate being, being connected and hearing the story. Um, we're wrapping up. So gig XR, G I G X R.com is where mm -hmm. people can learn more about it. Um, yep. David King Lastman on LinkedIn. I'll put the I'll put all these links in in the show notes, including the yep. the episode to, on 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 your Explore XR um, uh, with Luke. I think from it, Luke, maybe. yeah. And there's other incredible stories there as well. So, Absolutely. David, this has been a joy, um, as we expected. Um, so appreciative. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's my pleasure, and 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 thanks for all the work you're doing, Chris. It's it's, it's good stuff out there. Thank you for listening. Download the Simplicity Toolkit from ebullient.com to discover the power of the Simplicity Scan and Sprint. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite player.